great to be with you at Abbey. It always feels like being with family, and uh, uh, especially now with our daughter Emma and Johnny as part of the Wood, uh, as part of the Abbey family too. So it's a special joy to be with you. And uh, um, Pam and I uh, last year we celebrated 52 years of ministry in the city, and uh, Abbey's been part of that those years over all that time. We can thank God for the link with yourselves and. Um, to have Ebi also as part of that wider link of the Woodlands kind of uh, associate churches as well. So we thank God for you and the joy of being here today. Uh, in fact, on, on this evening, it's our third Sunday evening, we normally have a kind of celebration we used to have on a first Sunday. If any of you are free, those are always a great opportunity. Churches coming together from all around the Bristol area. And we've got Greg Downs with us tonight, who's uh, got an amazing ministry around the country. But I, I particularly want to share with you today a, a kind of prophetic word that I feel God has been stirring in my heart for the church at this time and uh, so you've left me with an open theme but it'll be very relevant to what you're about to do with your new series of hearing from God and also with Pentecost Sunday next Sunday it'll be a great introduce introduction into Pentecost too so these three words are the three words that I felt God stirring it is about pursuing his presence pursuing his presence what does it mean to be pursuing God's presence in our life? Now, I say, Ebby has a special part in our life, so I, I pray for you every day, every day, and a number of you here I pray for by name every day, and part of that prayer has been particularly over the years as things can go up and down, but just how there is ever increasing that sense of God's presence, of hearing from God, that sense of God's unfolding purposes for our lives. And sometimes we think of the presence of God, we think of it in a very passive way. We think that we go to church and you come into God's presence and then you leave church and you leave God's presence. But actually the presence of God is something that's not just a passive thing, but we can actually engage with. James says those amazing words, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So you mean I can actually initiate, I can activate it, it were, in my life. yes. You can consciously draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It's that sense of the presence of God that we don't just when we come into church, but how do we carry God's presence with us? What does that mean, to, uh, to carry the presence of God wherever we are? I know um, I can say it without embarrassing because Emma's gone out with the children, but um, Johnny and Emma, just um, a few days ago, they were doing a day of exam invigilation. Now, for many of you, you've forgotten those times when you used to, but uh, this was... Uh, and so Emma was looking after a sports hall at a school full of... Uh, pupils lined up with their desks doing their GCSEs and uh, but that day she'd felt a particular kind of stirring when she'd read the scriptures and a word had come to her of where God makes that promise to Joshua God says to Joshua Joshua wherever you go I will go with you and she had this real sense that day as if you know, it's the presence of God. I'm taking the presence of God with me. And she said, I went into that hall, and once we'd introduced and settled them down, here yeah, they all start on the exams. And I'm looking around all these children, you know, and I'm thinking, for many of these children, they will never ever go to church necessarily and go into the presence of God. But I can bring the presence of God to them. What does it mean to carry the presence of God? And so she started, I mean, she's meant to be invigilating. There's no better way of invigilating than actually doing this. So uh, she started praying for the lad on this end, and she went around all the hall, every child praying for them. And some of them, one of them had just sunk his head in his hands, thinking he was giving up, and she prayed for him. And, and she, she prayed for all the children in the hall. And that sense of, uh, of prayer covering. You know, in fact... The very word for prayer, often when Jesus, you know, says to his own disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray with me. It's that word of what we use for vigil, where we, you know, keep it. So often when I pray, I pray every day for a lot of different people. And sometimes I say, oh, Rob, could you pray for me? I've got a, a driving test coming up or I've got a job interview or whatever it may be. And I say, oh, when is it? It's next Tuesday. You know, what time is it? On next? It's 10 o'clock next Tuesday. And it's lovely to be able to pray at 10 o'clock next Tuesday, what I would call prayer vigiling. You're actually praying as it's happening. So that's what exam invigilation is. You're watching over, but to be making it a prayer vigil as opposed to just an invigilation. So how do we carry God's presence with us? And I just want to think briefly this morning in, in three particular ways in which we can carry the presence of God, be pursuing his presence, drawing near to God. And those are key in what I would call pursuing his presence is pursuing the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit who makes real the presence of God to us. Jesus himself said, when the Spirit comes, he will take of the things concerning me and will make me real to you, make my presence real to you. The second one is fullness of joy. 
Psalm 16 says those amazing words that in his presence is fullness of joy. And then the third one is pursuing his presence is pursuing that fullness of God's purposes in our lives. The presence of God is the key to guidance in our lives. Listen to these words from Exodus chapter 33. This is where Moses is about to lead the people of God through the desert. Forty years, disobedient, arrogant, you know, difficult group of people. And he says, oh God, you've called me to, 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 to lead these people, but Lord, show me. And so let's read Exodus 33, and I'm reading from verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know and you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Listen to these words. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Amazing. What is it that makes us distinctive? You say, oh, well, I carry a Bible or I go to church or I say, no, no, no. What is it that makes me distinctive from all the other people? It is the presence of God. The presence of God. We carry that presence with us. And nor is this more evident than for the early church. That day of Pentecost, 120 of them in an upper room, never they felt further away from God. They felt abandoned. It, all, it was all over. We'd hoped for so much. And where's God now, as it were? And here they are behind locked doors and fear. But what made the difference? Suddenly a mighty rushing wind. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they have a sense of God's presence more than they've ever known before. What made the difference? The fullness of the Holy Spirit. And this is what it says. And, and, and follow it carefully. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the birthright of the church. For every one of us as believers, this is the key to living the Christian life. The only way we can live it effectively is in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say that, you know, it's the day of Pentecost and you know, on that day, 90 of them got filled with the Holy Spirit and two weeks later, another 10 of them and two months later, another 10 and 20 years later, there was the last few. No, all of them, all a mixed bunch, all different people, but all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. For all of us, for all of us as followers of Jesus, this is the key to living our Christian life. It's the birthright, it's what makes the difference, is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But we need to understand also what that means. Fullness we sometimes use as a kind of self-satisfying thing. I'm full. You know, you, 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 maybe someone's invited you to Sunday lunch today and you've you just had a great meal with them and they say, um, you know, if you ever go to Adrian Rose, I mean, after just a few minutes of having a Sunday lunch there, and they say to you, do you want some more roast potatoes? You say, no, I'm full. And by full, it means I don't want any more. But it's not like that with God. In the kingdom of God, so often it's upside down. The whole purpose of fullness is that now when I receive more, it overflows. The whole purpose is not just self-satisfaction. I'm filled with the, the whole purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that I can overflow with the Holy Spirit. You know, we used to sing a little song, my cup's full and overrun, overflowing. You know, the whole purpose is the overflow because it's the overflow that makes a difference in our worship. You know, sometimes we struggling worship, we're feeling a bit distant from God, a difficult week. Do you know what makes a difference? Is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's an overflow. Even that release of spiritual gifts, you see in those one picture we've been talking of earlier, but the gifts of the Spirit, often that release them, whether it's tongues or prophetic word, is when there's that overflow of the Holy Spirit. The overflow. In our witness, what makes a difference is not me struggling to, to find something to say or find the right answer, it's the overflow. You see, when you take a, a, a glass and fill it with water, you know, once it's full, it, everything from then on, when it's more, it overflows. Now, you could be 98% full and you won't overflow. You know what I mean? You could even be 99% full today, but you won't overflow. You only overflow when you're full. But once you're full and you overflow, everything around you gets wet. That's the nature. There's something infectious. You know, it's like, I often say it's like falling in love, you know, for those who are parents who've got teenage children, you know, they'd never tell you they've got a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but, you know, you're just having lunch and, 
He just keeps talking about Janet said this and Janet said that and Janet did this and who is this Janet? It's because he's just fallen in love with her. He can't help talking about her. Why is to be so in love with Jesus? There's an overflow. You just can't help talking. It's not, oh, you've got to mention Jesus next time. No, you just can't help talking about it. It's the overflow. Now, this is so true for these early disciples. Listen to what happens. In Acts 2, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. In just a little while, God is doing amazing things through them. But you see, they were just ordinary folk. A few days before, had been terrified and frightened. Like anybody else, they were fearful of the future. They weren't particularly bright. They were just been, well, most of them have been fishermen and all sorts of others. They, they didn't have a great education. They didn't have great achievement, anything special. But when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, there was a boldness and a courage. So much so that as they began to declare, in fact, one stage they're saying, even, they'd just seen a miracle happen and the religious leaders are all attacking them and arguing. They said, look, look, there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved but Jesus. And the religious leader looked at me and said, they were amazed. said they were so surprised because these they had such courage and they realized that they were just uneducated ordinary people that's what he says about you know you might feel today well rob it's okay for you to speak like that or you know to hear about this but i just i just feel an ordinary person this is who they were they were ordinary people yeah but rob i'm not any great education i'm not use a public no they were uneducated but this was what made the difference and even their opponents recognized it the unbelievers, they said, but they realized they'd been with Jesus. That's what it says. They said, such courage are these, and they're just ordinary and educated, but they've been with Jesus. It's the presence of God in our lives. It's the presence of Jesus daily in our living that makes that difference. There's an overflow that comes from that. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, even in just the most ordinary circumstance of life, you know, or even on holiday, wherever we are, it's not just when we're in church, you know. Last Christmas uh, day, we, we went to spend it with our son Greg and his family, We've got three grandchildren. Emma Johnny came with us as well, and uh, this is up in Birmingham, and uh, <clears throat> it was Christmas morning, and uh, it was a Sunday. This past year, Christmas on a Sunday, and so we went to church. Where they, they go, and for me, it was unusual because uh, I was in church, but no responsibility. I wasn't speaking, I wasn't welcome, I wasn't doing anything. In fact, um, the family was sat in a row, and there was so much of them with all the, the grandchildren. And uh, our granddaughter has just started a PhD, and uh, she met this lovely fellow from Denmark, and he was there as well, sat there, and. Uh, um, he couldn't get back home for Christmas, and so he, he was staying with the family. And oh, the whole row was in front of me. I sat on the very back row behind them. And as I'm sat there, and the worship, the, stu- the service begins, and we stood, stood up here. And as, as we begin to worship, I felt that kind of wow factor, what I call the Holy Spirit, that kind of overflow where you, ooh, you just feel that stirring. And, and, and Hannah, our granddaughter, and Martin were sat right in, or stood right in front of me. Uh, and I really felt that stirring for them. And I, I began praying for them and feeling that the more I prayed, the more I felt, oh, God really put on my heart so much so that when we went back for, for Christmas lunch, um, I, I particularly made a ch- chance to sit beside Matt on the couch. You know, well, the Christmas lunch is being prepared, a big affair, you know, with all the trimmings and that. And, and I'm, I'm chatting with Martin. I said to Martin, Matt, I said, it was great to see you at church this morning. I said, are you familiar? He said, no, he says, I, I never go to church. He said, it's only since I've got known Hannah. I, I've started going to church. He said, I've just come to stay over Christmas with the family. He said, and he sort of whispered almost because the family were all around prepared. He said, you know what? They even say prayers when they eat some food together. I said, really? <laughs> You know, and yeah, he said. I said, are you embarrassed by that? He said, no. He said, it's nice. I feel a bit part of the kind of community. I said, I said, have you ever prayed? No, I never ever prayed. Have you ever been to church? No, I, I don't normally go to church. Have you ever read the Bible? No, I've never read the Bible. Really? I said. I, I said, and you know, going even this morning, I said, is it something you'd be interested in exploring more about? He said, to be honest with you, Pa, that's they call me as granddad, you know, my Pa. To be honest, Pa, he said, uh, I would be interested actually exploring. It's all completely new to me. I said, look, after lunch, we'll have a chat. We've been called now for Christmas lunch, and in we go for Christmas lunch with all the trimmings, and after lunch we were going to have our chat, but we started on games and then charades. It was about midnight by the time we'd finished everything, and so we never got round to the conversation. And I was only going to be there. We were only there for Christmas Day and then going back on the Boxing Day morning. So in the morning we got up, had breakfast, and we were out to go, and I, I see Martin and, and Hannah just to say cheerio, and I said cheerio, and I said, oh, Martin, I've, I've not forgotten our conversation. Would you still be interested in exploring a bit more about the Christian faith and the Bible? He said, Pa, I would be. He said, but it's too late now. I'm back off up north now. I said, well, give me your, give me your mobile number. I'll WhatsApp you. So he did. Give me his WhatsApp number, his mobile number. 
Um, not the next day, but the day after, I WhatsApped him, and uh, I did a video WhatsApp with him, and uh, said, Martin, I said, uh, it was great just to have that brief conversation, I said, but, um, you know, are you really interested in exploring more? I want to sense, you know, hope, and he said, yeah, he said, I would, and so I had an amazing conversation for the next hour or so about the existence of God, does God really exist, and the meaning of faith, and I said, would you, would you really like to to explore more about the Bible. He said, he said, I would, he said, but I wouldn't know where to begin. I said, well, look, the easy way to begin is that in the Bible there are four biographies of Jesus. They're short, not like these political biographies, the great tomes that take you weeks to read. You know, you can read them in extra no time. Just, uh, I said, but they cover an amazing insight into who Jesus was and what he taught. And I said, why don't you just take one? He said, well, I haven't got a Bible. I said, well, you can most likely, uh, uh, he's now up north, so I'm not miles away. I said, yeah, otherwise I'd have lent him one. But you know, I said, you can get it online. And I said, find John's gospel. You need to just go through it sort of uh, towards the end, as it were, and, uh, um, and just read the first three chapters. He said, I'll do that. I said, but what I want you to do, Martin, is write down any questions you've got as you go through it. He said, I'll do that. I said, email me when you got them. So this was Christmas week now, week after Christmas. And uh, sure enough, um, the day after, Hannah gave me a call as well. and said, pa, she said, could I do that with Martin as well? Could we do it together? I said, yeah, do it together and just put your questions down. So they did. In fact, on the Thursday, they sent me an email with their questions and uh, all sorts of, I mean, there's something very, I find very wonderful and to me very stirring when somebody who's never really ever read the Bible themselves is reading it for the first time ever. And they're questions, you know. Even John's gospel, first line, in the beginning was the word. Pa, what, what does the word mean? Why, why, why word, you know? I said, well, but we use words to communicate. That's how we communicate. But God wanted to communicate to us, and he wanted to communicate so much, and he so loved us that the word became flesh in Jesus, and God communicated himself to us. Oh, he said, but he goes on to say, the lamb of God, well, why, why lamb? I mean, it's an innocent little person, kind of, you know, like we say, oh, nice little lamb, you know, kind of, you know. No, 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 I said, it's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, what do you mean by taking away? He never, ever knew about animal sacrifice in the old text. It was all completely new, starting from scratch, you know, what's a Pharisee? And so he went on, you know, and he asked the same questions as Nicodemus. Well, what do you mean, born again? Okay. And so we go through them. We were an hour and a half. They were sat on a sofa with a laptop in front of them, and I, I'm, I'm doing a video call with them going through it. And they were really interested. Now, for Hannah, she already had a background of that, but, but somehow she had lapsed, and she just wanted to renew that. And for Martin, it was completely new. So at the end of it, because that was all we'd agreed to do was just three chapters, and I said, would you like to do more? He said, oh, we really we, we would. He said, we did a little bit every day. I said, well, okay, for the next week, do seven chapters, all right? That's the next seven chapters of John, and, and just write down your questions. They said, we'll do that. He said, but Pa, can we also this time write down what we think are the answers to the questions? So we just give an idea of, I said, that'd be really helpful to understand, you know, where you're at, and, and so they did. In fact, the next Friday, when they sent them through, I printed them out ready for the Saturday morning. We would do it at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Uh, and it was a page and a half of A4 with their questions and answers. And, and, and so we begin to go through them again. And, and again, you really felt each question, we'd work it through, and then I'd ask them, does is, is that, that make sense? And they, yeah, I can see that now, Pa. And uh, we didn't question that. We're on the, then we give them another seven chapters. So I'm, I'm getting well on now. Two sevens are 14 plus three, that's 17. I've only got four chapters left of John's Gospel. And, but... You know, they were all, by that third one, they were full of it. And honest questions like, you know, why did Jesus take so long to go and help Lazarus, his best friend? He did so many people. Couldn't he have just healed him? Well, he could have. But Jesus says, you know, it would be even a greater glory, not just to heal, but to raise him from the dead. And actually, this was for God's glory. And so, so they went through and it was all new. But now we're getting on. I've only got one more week with them, less, less. And so I said, only oh, next week will be our last one. But you know what often happens when somebody, when you read a book, you know, a novel, on the back cover often the, the author gives a little paragraph of just saying why he's written the book. You know, I went to the Arctic and saw the penguins and he writes all about penguins. Or, but John does that. He says, these things have I written. First of all, he says, there are many other miraculous signs at Jesus' death that I've not written. Well, that's not very helpful in no more. But he said, these have I written sufficient for anyone to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, to have life in his name. Well, I said, Martin, I said, over these three weeks, has it helped you to understand who Jesus is? Pa, he said, you can't imagine, he said. For me, it was all completely new. It had always been kind of superstition and myth I'd heard about, he said. But 
I really have come to understand how significant Jesus is. I said, that's wonderful, Martin. And he goes on to say, and that by believing you could have life in his name, is, is that something you would want, Martin? He said, I, I think I would, Pa. He said, but I wouldn't know where to start. I said, would you like me to help you how to start? He said, can you? I said, well, I can explain to you those simple steps. I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's got to be so simple that anyone could believe, even someone who couldn't read John's Gospel or write like you've been doing. But it's profound. There's something very wonderful about that step of faith. And I, if, if I'd been with him, I would have pulled out, usually got in my back pocket or somewhere else, but I'll have one. There we are, I'd have pulled out my Why Jesus, and I would have gone through my Why Jesus with him. Which, it's got a simple section in the Why Jesus, there'll be some at the back here, which just has an A, B, C of what it means to become a Christian. I, I said, even if I took, put in my own words, you know, kind of, A is just simply to admit, just admit, you need, say sorry to God. I mean, the Bible uses long words like repentance, but, you know, it's turning from all you know wrong. And, and then B is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, as it says. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And C is to commit your life to him. He said, but, but how do you do that? I said, well, for many people, it'd just be expressing in prayer those three simple things. Oh, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Yeah, he said, but I've never ever prayed. I wouldn't know how to do it. Would you like me to help you to do that? Can you, Pa? I said, well, I'll... I'll just go through a moment, simply what that prayer says. And then if you understand it, we pray. And so we did. Just, I went through him what it meant to pray that. And I said, would you like, he said, can we do that? Can you help me to pray? I said, yeah, we'll do it together. And so I just prayed slowly aloud. And there sat on that sofa, both of them, miles away up north, <laughs> prayed aloud. But as they prayed, I felt all heaven rejoice. You feel sometimes, there's no greater joy than seeing someone, death to life, it's... All heaven, it says, rejoice every time a person. So uh, as they finished praying, and I, I then prayed for them and said amen, I said, welcome into the family of God. And they both said to me, actually, Pa, they said, uh, this is a Saturday morning, do you think we'd better go and find a church tomorrow? I said, well, that wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, well, Pa, we'd like to do some more. What's the, what's the next book in the Bible? I said, well, the next one is Acts of the Apostle. And just about three weeks ago, we just finished going through Acts. And they just asked about being baptized. And just, but, you know, that sense of... That overflow of God's spirit, that sense of where, for all of us, we're just ordinary people, and yet the courage of those first disciples when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I must hasten, because the second of these is to be filled with joy. To pursue his presence is to pursue that fullness of joy. Again, those words from Psalm 16, in his presence is fullness of joy. Now, Jesus himself says those amazing words, you know, that my joy, my joy, this is Jesus' joy, is a distinctive joy. It's not just the joy a world gives us. It's a joy that Jesus gives us. This presence brings to our lives. It's that my joy may be in you so that your joy may be full. What kind of joy is this? It's the joy of the Lord that speaks of where the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's not just that, you know, when God's with me, I feel stronger and, and then I'm joyful. No, the joy is the source of the strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. There's a, there's a welling up within. Jesus describes that work of the Holy Spirit that brings like, like streams of, well, of living water welling up inside of us from deep within that welling up. You know, sometimes when you feel joy, that inner welling up of joy is a joy that comes from inside. See, most people... Our joy is usually stimulated by external circumstances. You just passed your driving test and you're so excited. I mean, you're going down the road and, and I can see a smile on your face. I say, oh, what's making you so happy? Oh, I just got a, I just got a promotion at work. Or, you know, oh, this has just happened. It's some external circumstance. But let me tell you this. Anyone in the world would be joyful for that. There's nothing distinctive about that. That's not uniquely Christian. What is different is when you've just failed your driving test and just lost your job and you're going down the road but someone looks at you and say, Rob, you seem to be, you seem to have a kind of peace and a joy. Even in the midst of those circumstances, when all hell is let loose sometimes in your life, what kind of joy is this? It's a source of inner joy. The Bible speaks of it as a joy that is unspeakable but full of glory. It's not the joy that's measured by how loud you laugh. Or how, how many jokes you can tell and how uh, you know, brash you may be in your joke telling and you feel, oh, he's the life and soul of the party, you know. It's a joy that comes from within. 
It's those streams of living water welling up inside of us. So Peter is describing, he's towards the end of his life and they're going through really difficult times. All hell let loose around them. Some of them have already been martyred and others are suffering for their faith. Says, Though now for a season, if need be, we're going through all sorts of trials and testing. He says, it's like our faith is being tested like gold. It's being refined in a fire. And yet, we rejoice in a joy unspeakable and full of glory in him whom having not seen, we love. And though we see him not, yet we rejoice with his joy. What kind of joy? It's a joy unspeakable but full of glory. It's the joy of the Lord. All my springs of joy are in you. When that joy wells up, it overflows. It just can't happen. There's something contagious about it. It's the joy of the Lord. You know, just recently I had a dear friend who was going for a hospital appointment where he'd had some tests and was waiting the results. When he got there, it was really bad news, hard news, sad news. He had aggressive cancer and wouldn't have long to live. Suddenly, Rob, my world fell apart, he said. That sense, I don't even know how many days I've got left. And suddenly it changed everything. When I got back home, I had my reading for the day. And as I read these scriptures, they just came alive to me. I did something from deep inside me. He said, I read those words that I'd read before, but somehow, Psalm 139, it says this. All my days are ordained by you. They are written in your book before one of them comes to pass. He said, suddenly I felt, Rob, as if my time is in God's hands, like a book that's already been written, that sense that he's ordained those purposes. And suddenly I felt a peace that began deep within, where in the pit of my stomach I'd felt that sinking feeling earlier in the day. Suddenly I felt welling up inside of me a source of joy. Is I can to share with my family. They were so surprised. They were, what kind of joy is this? It's the joy of the Lord. It's a joy that's got an eternal dimension to it. That presence of God, my joy, says Jesus, in you, it'll bring a fullness. The presence of God. And pursuing that presence is pursuing the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of joy. And thirdly, that fullness of his purpose is in our life God's guidance God's direction every day of our life every step that we take all of us every one of us here at this moment there's a next step we're about to take in our lives you know even if you say well I won't do anything that's your next step you know there's a next step we're on a journey and Moses is about to lead this whole rabble of people through a desert he says oh God how can I lead them who are you going to send who are you going to show me? How do we ever go? God says, my presence will go with you. Oh God, if, if your presence doesn't go with me, don't send me from here. What would it mean for us this morning to say, oh God, if your presence does not go with us out of this building today, don't send us out, Lord. What does it mean to take God's presence with us? Perhaps more than we've ever known before. A depth of reality made real by the Holy Spirit. A release from deep within whereby we sense that welling up. The presence of God. We're about to begin a series here at Ebby on hearing God. Hearing from God. Those promptings of God's Spirit. That sense of God's direction for our life. Whatever we're doing, wherever we're going. You know, as I say, I feel called to a life of prayer. So every day I pray for many different situations. People, sometimes people say to me, well, Rob, how, how do you pray regularly for lots of different people? You know, with Paul's letters, he, he talks often in all my prayers, you always, from the first day until now. And the end of his letters, long lists of people he's been praying for. How do you guard that faithfulness in prayer and yet a freshness? I often call those divine twin situations where, you know, truth lies in the tension. I want to be faithful in prayer, consistent. I promise to pray. I want to be able to pray every day for that. But, but how do I guard it? Just and become legalistic. It's that freshness, those promptings of God's. So every day when I pray, for some of you here, I pray for by day, every day, by day, every day in prayer. But every day, every day, even this morning, early this morning. It's just like reading scripture. You know, I've read, I read through the Bible every year. So these stories, I know them off by heart. But every day when I read the Bible, every day, I'm looking for a word just from God. So I write on my watch. That is on my watch even today, my little, uh, uh, my reading this morning. And just that sense of every day, 
God prompts somebody, some, some, maybe someone I haven't seen for a while, or sometimes I'll just drop an email and say, you've been on my heart today. So some of you know that's why I've done that when I've done it with you. But you know, you've been on my heart recently, and that's because that day is stirred for me, and I feel that. Or, or maybe I see that person, I haven't seen them for months, or, 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 or something will happen. I mean, the other day I was praying for a dear friend called Paul, and he hadn't been at church for quite a while, and was obviously going through some difficulties, but I wasn't quite sure the best way to make contact without being intrusive. I didn't want to sort of feel it. And, um, and yet I felt I'm not likely to see him at church next week because he won't be there. And anyway, I've been praying that morning and, and there's so much on my heart that I, even during the day I went for a kind of prayer walk in the, I went, was going to Blaze and I often use Blaze as sort of hallowed ground for me. Then I, I was on my way up to Blaze. Um, as I was going along, you pass just, you go down Henbury, or the, uh, a little lane on the left-hand side. And I'm going down, I felt God say to me, go up that lane. Now you may think, well, that's a strange thing. You know, you know when, when um, I get this amazing story in the Bible where Philip and uh, he's been ministering in Samaria and seeing amazing miracles, and suddenly an angel says to him, I want you to go on that road down there, down south. The road down south, that's down the desert. I don't go anywhere. Yeah, I won't take it. And, and he, so he gets on the road. And he's going down, and then in the desert he sees this cloud of dust, and there's a, in the distance a chariot, and God says to him, hey, I want you to draw near to that chariot. That prompting of God's spirit, that still small voice says, this is the way, walk in it. How do we, how are we attuned to that? How are we hearing God in our lives? Not just the big decisions, a job we're going to make or a house we're going to buy, but every day of our lives. So I'm that morning, on my way at Blaze, I passed that little lane and I felt God saying, we go up that lane. <laughs> I didn't even sure it would get me to the other side. Anyway, I went up the lane, tall stone walls, just like we saw in that picture, only much taller on either side. And I'm walking along and there's a bend in the lane. I turn around the bend, I couldn't see around the corner. I turn around the bend, I bump into someone. I, oh, so I'm sorry that. And I look at him, it's Paul. Paul, I've been praying for. I've been and suddenly here he is. And, and, and now because of that prompting of God's spirit, because he put on my heart then I'm not just to say hi Paul good to see you and on my way this is a divine appointment you, know, you sense there's you know God is preparing us for situations all the time that's those promptings of God's spirit that just helps us to be open that this is God's purpose unfolding I could tell you amazing stories you know many years ago I must close this story I'd well, be here all day, but um, uh, many years ago, before those 52 years or 53 years this time of Christian, full-time Christian ministry here in the city, um, I was working for one of, the, well, was one of the biggest companies in the world in those days, and there were lots of exciting things. Anyway, we, we'd done some amazing developments of new products and things, and um, I'd been given an opportunity to go to the Middle East for three months to do an interesting research project on the, the industrial and um, technological development of the nation of Israel. At that time, it was fast growing at that time and doing, you know, reclaiming the desert, desert reclamation, lots of things, but also into IT. Before we had the internet, before we had emails, before we had any of those sort of things, Israel was quite an early uh, startup one in many of those things. And so I had this amazing time. I spent the first month at the Hebrew University and then traveled around Israel, lots of different um, fascinating things that were happening there. But one thing I'd always wanted to do before I went on that trip, I had been in touch with a dear old lady in Bethlehem. Her name was Auntie May. She was blind, been blind through her life. And, but she did a remarkable work uh, of this home for disabled people, for blind and other disabled ones. She worked among them and did this amazing work. And I'd always felt if ever I was able to go to Israel, I'd love to be able to visit her in Bethlehem. But it seemed impossible because in those days, as I tell you how long ago it was, I went because that was before the Six Day War. Six Day War was 67, so that's a long time ago. And, uh, uh, and uh, in those days, you couldn't cross from Israel into Jordan and to Bethlehem because the, the, the boundaries were changed, as it were. The Six-Day War changed that. So you, you couldn't travel across. You couldn't even communicate across. There was no email in those days. But you couldn't send a letter from Israel to, to there or you couldn't phone across. There was no way you could communicate. So I'd, I'd said to Auntie May three months before I'd, before I'd gone, I said, if ever I, I'm able, I'd love to be able to come and visit you, but it won't most likely be possible on this trip. But anyway, after the three months of all around Israel and got to know some fairly significant folk in the, in the country, and I managed to negotiate with the... Um, uh, British Embassy, a second passport, a legal exercise, a second passport. It was a blank passport, though. Here I am in Israel with a blank passport, which would enable me to go out of Israel into Jordan, but, you know, but I'm actually going to cross from Israel. So it was a very um, kind of 
I don't know, harrowing experience. It was a, a, at Jerusalem, it was known as a Mandelbaum Gate. I was the only person crossing in the day, and it took hours to cross. They checked everything, every hair on my comb, as it were. And, you know, by the time I got through that, I was absolutely exhausted. And so I wanted to just find somewhere quiet before I then thought of how I was going to get down to Bethlehem and, and, and surprise Auntie May, as it were, arriving. Anyway, um, uh, the only place I knew uh, uh, that Pope talked of was the, the Garden Tomb. If any of you visited Israel, you may have gone there to the Garden Tomb. And in those days, it was a little old wooden great creaked open and it was a doorman on the gate and I went in and there was a stone bench, I can still remember it now as if it was today and uh, I put my, my, my luggage down on this bench and uh, as I sat on the bench, absolutely exhausted uh, I'd no sooner sat down than the wooden gate creaked open and I could hear an old voice saying to the man on the gate is brother Robert here? and I, I stood up hairs on the back of my head and I said well, well, well my, my name's Robert and by now the gate had fully opened and the lady had stepped inside. It was an old lady and I could see as she looked, moved towards me that she was blind, couldn't see. And I, I suddenly said, are you, are you Auntie May? She said, yes, I am, and you must be Brother Robert. But Auntie May, however, did you know I would ever be able to come or I would be here or today or now? Or... And she said to me like as if it was an everyday occurrence. She said, oh, this morning I was in the presence of the Lord talking to him. And he said to me, go to the garden tomb at noon today and you'll find Brother Robert there. And I could have fainted. I could have. <laughs> but of course, that was what was happening in these New Testament days. When he says to Philip, take that road down south, <laughs> you know, and he did it. And there's a chariot in the distance and he did it. You know, that sense of how in our lives today be more attuned to God's voice so prayer is not just telling God what we want to do and we're going to go there and could he help us get there and we're saying Lord where do you want me what do you want how can we have that sense of hearing God's voice those promptings of God's spirit what does it mean to be living in the presence of God every day of our lives pursuing his presence pursuing that fullness of the Holy Spirit that fullness of joy that fullness of his purposes is that something you long for? Is that something you're open to? It's not you've got to be extraordinary. For these first that they were just ordinary people. It's not you've got some special education or you've got to read the Bible ten times at least. They were uneducated. But they've been with Jesus. Do you want to know more of his presence with you? That's my prayer. My prayer in, in coming this morning. That's my prophetic word at this time for the church, I feel. You know, even for an unbeliever... If you're here today and it's all new to you, you know what the Bible says? It talks about even that early church, that Pentecost church. An unbeliever comes in. Do you know what happens? When the spirit begins to move, that, that unbeliever falls down and begins to worship God and says, God is among you. It's the presence of God that makes the difference. 